ultrasound, trauma, and simulation in limited resource settings. He has years on ground experience in East Africa, focused in education, research, and system development in acute settings. Karibu. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope we're awake. It's been a pretty awesome morning so far, and I have a full uh, slide deck. Is it? Can it be up here? I'd rather look at them than myself, because I'm sure all of you would. And normally when I give lectures, I love to have people interact and yell at me, but I know for the interest of time, we probably can't do that, because I want to try and stay on track, and I got a lot of stuff. So I'm Steve, and I do a lot of ultrasound and a lot of other stuff. But the best job and the most important job I've ever had is being BB's partner, uh, Ellen Weber's partner as an attending at Muhumbili way back in the day when the residency started. So I've been living and working in Tanzania on and off for uh, well over a decade and it's, this is just so awesome to be here with all of you and I can't thank Peter and his committee enough. I'm, I just, I, I'm just overwhelmed and so impressed and so thank you very much for putting this together. It's just awesome. All right, so this is actually a case we saw here. You know, we get these x-rays, they shoot them, they put them up on the box. They're, it doesn't look any better on my screen than your screen. You, use, you, know, you don't even have to use your doctor words. It's like, I don't know, it's too white there. Maybe it's some white pushing that way. What is happening? I don't know. And you know, ultimately, you put an ultrasound on it, and this becomes a whole lot clearer as to what you're dealing with, right? And what you're witnessing here is the benefit of being an attending. You see, I'm standing back taking a video while the residents are getting the pus all over their shoes. Um, but, but this clearly shows you how much ultrasound can show you that you can. I don't have any disclosures. I work at a place in Hennepin. It's in the great north. It's like negative 20 and the lakes are frozen. But why I wanted to show this is this. This is an ultrasound machine. It's on all of our critical care bays. And so I have an ultrasound on the patient before my nurses even open the sticker packets to see what's going on with my patients. I used to work a lot here. There's been changes. We'll just leave it at that. And I work with a lot of other jokers. You guys uh, may see, uh, know uh, some of them. Well, this is a classic ER move. This is Yash. Look at the angle of this ladder. He climbs up this thing at 45 degrees on the emergency department to take a cool picture. You know, we're bright, but not that bright, I guess. So what this won't do, I can't make you an, a master ultrasonographer if you're not already. I'm not teaching ultrasound technique, and I can't show you everything cool about ultrasound, but I'm going to try a little bit. What we will do is we'll challenge the idea that ultrasound is a static imaging process, that it has to be done in a different department. This isn't something like when I started doing uh, work at Kenyatta over a decade ago, you'd come into Kenyatta, if someone had trauma, you would order the FAST exam, from radiology, which would occur six to eight hours later, right? That's not a fast exam, and it should be done at the bedside by our providers. Uh, I want you to get you excited about ultrasound, and I'm going to take a look at a lot of uses, okay? And I would propose that anyone who works in any setting, I used to say if you're working in low resource when I'm talking to my friends at home, but honestly, it doesn't matter what you are, if you're a pediatrician, an anesthesiologist, a dermatologist, you should be using an ultrasound because it will improve. So well, this is an emergency medicine conference. Let's just start with, suppose, 40-year-old female presents pulses. What should we do? Yeah, like call our team, you know, ask for help, airway, breathing, circulation, CPR, all those things that we know to do, right? I'm not going to make you go through that. Um, but what if you put the ultrasound on her heart uh, and it looks like this? That's her heart. That's a pericardial effusion. The right ventricle is almost completely collapsed there. Is doing CPR going to help this woman? No. The only thing that's going to help is either increase preload or reduce the pressure in that pericardial effusion, right? That's the only thing that's going to fix this woman. So this shows you very acutely how not everything that's pulseless or that you can't feel a pulse deserves the same treatment, right, as we would do in our algorithmic approach. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with ACLS. It's a good place to start so that we're all working in the same direction, but realizing that ultrasound can really open our eyes. This is just for fun. This is us sticking a needle in it. You see the poof of uh, air uh, as micro bubbles and put a wire in it. It's kind of fun. Um, there goes the wire and then draining the fusion. So we use a triple lumen. This is at the old Muhammadiyah. 
Um, and then you get a lot of, you get 700 cc's out and she's a new woman. So then just for fun, if you some, see something that looks like this in your setting, see those fibrinous strands? That's pretty cool. That's TB. TB, 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 and TB. Especially when you see in Sub-Saharan Africa, if you see fibrinous stranding in a pericardial effusion, the diagnosis is TB. Uh, how about this woman? Uh, 50 year old, you can't feel a pulse, she looks unconscious, she collapses. Her heart looks like this. Is CPR going to help this woman? No. I mean, her heart has got a 100% ejection fraction. The heart is doing what it can. What she needs is volume. I don't know why she needs volume, but she needs volume. And so CPR is not going to help this woman. Um, what we're looking at here is probably a similar, this is an IVC that's collapsing. So you can look and see what their volume status is and show that they're low volume. How about 40-year-old female presents pulses, she collapses, syncopizes in front of you, she's clammy, you can't feel a pulse. You look in her right upper quadrant, here's liver, this is kidney, this is fluid. You guys can see my cursor, yeah. This is fluid that's in there. Whoopsie daisy. Uh, there we go. And then you swing down into the abdomen in our setting, and here is a little friend not in the uterus with a heartbeat off to the side, and this is the source of this patient's you know, bleeding and syncope. This is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy with free fluid. Now, in the United States, we've done settings in a woman of childbearing age that comes in with syncope and abdominal pain. If you put them, tip their head down, and you do right upper quadrant view, and you see free fluid, 100% of the time it was a ruptured ectopic. So this is without a pregnancy test, without anything. Are there other things that can do this? Yes. There's every now and again some aberrant like hemangioma or a splenic artery aneurysm or some weird thing. But, you know, nine times out of ten, if you have a woman of childbearing age who has syncope or hypotension and you see positive uh, free fluid, that's an ectopic till proven. Even if you can't find the ectopic on pelvic ultrasound, um, you need to be very, very concerned that that's what you're dealing with. How about this? This is a person who's pulseless. On the right side of the thorax, you see nice lung sliding. That means that the pleura are up and there is no pneumothorax. On the left side, you see no sliding. The pleural line is this thing moving back and forth. Here's the pleural line over here. You don't see it sliding. That doesn't mean the lung isn't moving. It just means there's air in between the pleura, and so you don't see the sliding. So this person could have a tension pneumothorax that's causing her death. Is CPR going to help this person? CPR does not fix a tension pneumothorax. How about this person? This is kind of akin to the don't get this x-ray. The only reason that I have this ultrasound is like I said, I have an ultrasound on a patient before the nurses even open the stickers to, to get electrical monitoring. What do you think is going on here? If you saw an EKG tracing, what do you think it would look like? Squiggle, 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 squiggle. So we're seeing ventricular fibrillation. Now CPR might kind of help, I mean, in the sense that you need forward flow, but what's the treatment for this? Light it up. Yeah, shock this. Shock it all day, every day. Um, so I think we can now agree um, that ultrasound is very useful in critical care, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of you can see these examples, but what I want to talk about is some of the other cool stuff that we can see with it, okay? So what are some other uses? Eh, you guys know we can see gallbladder pathology, right? Here's a gallstone. We got some pericholecystic fluid. That's nothing new. But did you know you can do it at the bedside? You know, it might take you 15, and even if you don't see it, right, you throw it on, you look, if you see it, it's there. If you don't see it, fine, get your formal study. But you're probably saving yourself and the patient three hours if you see the pathology. You're like, okay, this is what it is. You can call the surgeon and be like, yeah, man, I'll get the formal, but just so you know, you know, I wouldn't go home just yet. How about vascular access? This is pretty well described, right? We can see a needle and a vein. We can see a wire coming in. This makes getting access, for those of us that aren't comfortable doing central access or in real difficult peripheral access, you know, ultrasound can help you be very comfortable in getting access on those challenging patients. Triple A's, we know that this is a common screening thing. We don't see this as much or haven't previously seen it, at least described in the data. Part of that is because when you have an age of populations that less than age 50, you won't see that much. You also can't find what you don't look for. So if no one's screening for triple A's, you won't see it. Now, what we do see is we see plenty of heart attacks and strokes and other arthrosclerotic disease. I don't know why we wouldn't be starting to see more complications from aorta. And everyone sees this pulsatile tube, and some might know, say, yep, it looks eyeballing four to five centimeters here. Yeah, it's a small aneurysm, right? Is that the whole aneurysm? This is where people get fooled. 
The whole aneurysm is from here to here. This is like a nine centimeter aneurysm. This is a don't move, don't touch, don't sneeze, don't do anything, go get this fixed. Uh, you know, go away from here, this is about to blow sort of scenario. So don't be fooled by just measuring the lumen. Make sure that you're really investigating that aneurysm and, and seeing all the mural thrombus and pseudoaneurysms out there. Of course, we can find deep vein thromboses. Here you see a vein that collapses fully. The vein goes away. Here we see this little blob. He stays put even when we try and collapse. So we can find DVTs. And we routinely do our own DVT studies in our department at home. So two-point discrimination here up at the groin, down at the knee, um, often in conjunction with a D-dimer, and, uh, and I'm done. Saves me hours of time waiting uh, for a formal study. Now this is an area that I think is, is the next frontier for you guys. We're doing this more and more and more at home, regional anesthesia, but it's a little bit slower to pick up because we're too spoiled. I can do a conscious sedation like that, like get a team together, put them down, propofol, ketamine, doesn't matter. Um, you know, so we do a lot of stuff under sedation. Here, that's not so easy, right? You know, we're not super comfortable giving one per kilo of propofol on our own if you don't have all the airway equipment and stuff that you would need to support someone's airway when you're doing, say, that college reduction or you're doing a hip dislocation reduction, etc. But here, the new machines even will highlight the, the nerve for you. The, we, I didn't put this on there. It automated, it sees the nerve next to the artery. It highlights it for you in yellow. And so you know exactly. So this is the nerve. Here's the artery. Here's the needle tip coming. Here's the needle tip, here's the nerve, here's the artery, and here you can start to see a little bit of black there. We're starting to infuse the local anesthetic. So now we've all had that little old lady who's fallen and broken her hip. She's crying in pain and you're like, oh my God, I'm torturing BB. So you're like, let's just give her a little dilated, a little morphine. Next thing you know, and they're like, ah, Dr. Tari, you know, she's not breathing and her sats are, oh crap. And you go in there and you open their airway and you wake baby up and then baby's screaming, oh. And then she's apneic and then she's screaming and then she's apneic. And this is the lower extremity fracture in our elderly patients. Or you could just do a nerve block and she is pain free with no opiates for 12 hours, right? I mean, this changes everything. And so regional anesthesia, I think, is something the next, as you guys improve your point of care ultrasound skills, I think that that's what we need to be talking about, Peter, at your national conferences and regional conferences, be doing more regional anesthesia and see if there are ways that we can do regional anesthesia workshops, because it will change care across Tanzania. Because you could do this in the bush, right? You need a needle, an ultrasound, and local anesthetic. That's what you need, right? And it jumps chasms of infrastructural necessity, like, all your sedation equipment, all this other stuff that you might not have at your district level hospitals, right? We can see appendicitis with it, right? And uh, the, you know, the number one way to find an appendicitis in a child if they're able to talk to you, give the probe to the child and tell them to put it on the pain. And that, that increases your sensitivity dramatically, like doubles it. Just let them drive the probe. They'll show you where their appendix is. It's pretty cool. How about these kids that won't walk? Is this a septic hip? Is this just uh, tenosynovitis that's a reactive process? I'm not sure, who, who we want, what are we gonna do? We can't get an MRI on this person. I really don't wanna tap a hip. Who knows how to tap a hip? I'm not blindly tapping a hip on a two-year-old. You know, this is a mess. You can ultrasound the hip and here's what you see. This is the femur. You can see the physis here. Here's the epiphysis, the metaphysis. Here is the, the joint capsule overside, and you can see the black fluid in there. That's the effusion. It is asymmetric. So you know that you definitely do have an asymmetric inflammatory process in this child's hip. Now, what could it be? Could it be blood? Could it be other things? Sure, and you gotta use history to help you figure this out, right? Like, what is there any traumatic history? What is the joint, what is the evaluation like? What's the exam like? You might be getting some inflammatory markers if you're able to, maybe a white count, maybe a CRP, ESR, something like that. But those aren't, those aren't bulletproof, right? We can all have a septic hip and have totally normal indices, uh, especially early, which is when you wanna find it, right? You don't wanna wait until this thing is a purulent mess. You wanna find it before the joint is destroyed. Well, I think a lot of us would feel pretty comfortable sticking a needle in this. If you could see this and you wanna know, is it infected? You just clean really, really well, sterile technique, an 18 gauge needle, you can see that there's no vessels between here and there, and you can watch your needle go into that joint, suck the fluid out, and send it for culture. Now this is assuming you have somewhere to send the fluid, right? You gotta have diagnostics. 
but easy for us to do. You already saw that consolidation. This, this image is just kind of cool for those of us ultrasound geeks. So this is a pneumonia. So we're up in the chest. We shouldn't see anything, but this looks like liver almost, right? And you can even see these black fluids in there that look like hepatic vessels in there. That's actually what we would call a fluid bronchogram. You're seeing fluid in the, the airways, what should be full with air. This is a consolidated lung with fluid in the, in the pathways. And then you guys saw this image earlier, right? This is lung that is completely consolidated because if there were air in there, we wouldn't be able to see it, surrounded by a ton of fluid. And this helps us decide how would we treat this pleural effusion, right? If I get in here and I see a ton of loculations, chest tube is going to probably not evacuate this all that well. Like that person, almost certainly, if it's all loculated, is going to need thoracic surgery or general surgery and going to need a VATS procedure or some sort of thoracotomy to assist the drainage if it's all loculated. But this is a simple effusion. So a chest tube will take care of this. And you could do that at, at most local facilities. How about the eye exam? If you're anything like me, you went through medical school and we're all sitting there with the ophthalmoscope and you've got some instructors like, and you see the, the fine edges of the disc and you see the vessels in the back and do you all see the optic nerve? We're all like, oh yeah, totally sad. Yep, for sure. Just to let them leave you alone because you're shining light in some person's eye and they're a non-dilated exam and you never see anything. I almost never try and look in anyone's eye anymore because I don't do dilated exams. I ultrasound their eye. And when you put an ultrasound on their eye, you can clearly see blood in the posterior chamber and you can clearly see a detached retina in the back. And I don't need to see anything else. I'm not showing you. Here's the, you can see the anterior compartment here for a second. I'll show it to you. When it comes back right here is the anterior and the lens. You see the flash of the lens behind and the iris is right up there, okay? And so with ultrasound, you can actually, you know, you get those patients and the eye is totally swollen shut from trauma and there's no way you can pry that eye open to see what's going on in there. You can put the ultrasound on it and you can shine light in their good eye and you can see consensual constriction of the pupil with an ultrasound. You can see the iris. You can see it move. It's pretty cool. Um, this goes back a ways. Um, when I first started, this is before the residency started, I was working locally here and they had started, they were getting a CT scan, the CT was broke, but they had started this, uh, this hydrocephalus and spina bifida program. So they had a bunch of kids with shunts in them, but the CT was broken because even though it was on an isolated circuit inside the hospital, they kept blowing up some circuit board in the CT every time they tried to use it. And so it was down until we got a new circuit board. And the neurosurgeon was like, hey, Steve, do you think you could look at the ventricles of this? And so sure enough, there's actually a lot of literature, a lot of it's out of Italy, but remember, our hydrocephalus kids, their fontanelle stays open. So you got two, three-year-old kids rolling around with an open fontanelle sometimes. So I can ultrasound through this open fontanelle and see their ventricles. So these are cerebral ventricles. And a one-off number doesn't tell you a ton, but what it does help me know is I can follow a kid immediately post-op and then at each of his visits. And so when that kid shows up to clinic, and you know, who knows, he's maybe he says he's crying, he's fussy, he vomited once, which is every child ever if you have children. The hard part then is, is my shunt malfunctioning? And you can ultrasound their ventricle and say, oh yeah, that ventricle is way bigger than it was two months ago. Or I can't tell you that it's not malfunctioning, but I can tell you that the ventricles are the same size as they were two months ago. Maybe let's give it a day and see if the kid just stops doing whatever it's doing, right? Like, and watch the kid. Versus ventricles are huge, that shunt needs revision, we need to do something about it. How about intracranial pressure? What you're looking at here again is an eyeball. This is the optic nerve. And we'll remember that the optic nerve sheath is contiguous with the dura. So as intracranial pressure goes up, your optic nerve sheath dilates, it gets bigger. We already know this, this is what we call when you see papilledema and you're looking at it through your otoscope or your ophthalmoscope, that's papilledema, is it swelling? Well, you can see that on ultrasound. So you can objectively measure the optic nerve sheath diameter and correlate it with elevated intracranial pressure. So you can help this. The sensitivity, the biggest study that I'm aware of in vivo in patients in Sub-Saharan Africa was done by myself and some colleagues in, in Kampala looking at cryptococcal HIV patients, right? And they're tough because they have wicked high ICPs. Has anybody treated someone with crypto HIV and done LPs on them? Nobody here? Like when you put the, when you put the needle in 
and you put a manometer on, it like shoots out the top. And then you can set another manometer on it and it'll shoot out the top of that. And the first time I saw them treat this, I was like, I was mortified because the house officer just like sticks the needle in, no problem. Out comes, he just put a kidney basin and just collected CSF, just let her drain to decrease their, their increased cranial pressure. And so when we were doing the study, the crypto HIV study was they got LPs on days 0, 1, 3, 7, and 14 as they went through their crypto treatment. So I had ICPs through their LP and then direct ICP monitoring with ultrasound looking. It's about 80% 80, 80 sensitive and specific. So it's not awesome, but that's using a cutoff of 0.5. As you get bigger and bigger, then your sensitivity and specificity, of course, gets much better. So when you see it and it's really big, it's there. That's what it is. You can see fractures. What you're looking at here is a rib. Now, for us, I put this in here at home, we like to see rib fractures, not because there's anything clinical, clinical you're gonna do about it, but it, uh, for us in our domestic violence cases, when we're trying to prove to the police that there's a higher level of assault, a fracture equals a felony. And you can see uh, fractures on ultrasound a whole lot easier than chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is very poor for picking up, especially non-displaced fractures. But even cooler than that is that you can do fracture reduction. You guys see this here, that white line? That's the cortex of the, of the distal radius. You guys see that white line there? Can anyone nod? Are you hearing me? Yes, no, maybe so. Come on, guys, I'm exciting. This is not sleepy. Let's go. So we can see the cortex here, and we can see the fracture, and you can see me manipulating that fracture. And so we actually researched this using a linear probe you can get as good a reduction using an ultrasound as you can with fluoroscopy in doing distal radius fracture. This is a Collie's fracture, like the distal radius is just poop, just kicked back from a foosh injury, right? Classic emergency medicine bread and butter. You can reduce this with great accuracy using an ultrasound. How about a felon in a water bath? Is that like a criminal in a hot tub? Does anybody know what that is? This is a, a finger infection of the distal tuft, and what you're looking at is a finger in cross-section. And you'd ask yourself, how is an ultrasound looking like a CT, right? Because uh, like, the ultrasound needs to touch the skin, so how do I get this rounded edge? This is how. You just take your finger, put it under water or whatever small object it is. You put your probe, most of them are waterproof, but if you don't know and you don't want to ruin it, just put it in a glove with some gel. And then you don't even need to touch the skin because the ultrasound's just going through the water and then penetrating what you're ultrasounding. And so you can do things like evaluate very curvy structures and things that are painful. So you can see the probe is not even touching the patient. And this is a metacarpal head. You're looking at my MCP joint. I'm just moving my finger like this. And what you see here is my flexor tendon. You see that thing that looks like a rope going over my metacarpal head. So you can very clearly see tendons and bones and joints using ultrasound. And so I wonder to myself, does this patient have flexor tenosynovitis or is there some other thing going on? Did they rupture their tendon? You can clearly see, here's your, meta, here's your metacarpal head, here's the flange, here's the, the tendon, and here is the sheath, because remember our flexor tendons have sheaths. And here's the fluid in the flexor tendon sheath, right? And so this is tendon tenosynovitis for sure. The question is, is it infectious or not? In the right clinical context, which most of them are, they are infectious. And this is operative management, right? This needs to be opened up. Call your orthopod, and they'll come down. What's the white count? What's the CRP? What's the, I was like, I don't care. This is what they have. This is their problem. It needs to get opened up. You can see small joints. You're afraid, ah, man, I don't think I can tap a wrist. They're small, they're hard, I don't know. Look at the procedure in a book, then put your ultrasound on it. You will see the joint, stick a needle in it. So here's a needle, you can see the needle sort of disrupting the tissue going into the joint. Foreign bodies become much easier to remove. That's what you're seeing here. You can see the forceps on the foreign body, pulling it out. We've all been this person, digging for glass. You've seen it, you see it on the x-ray, and you're in there with the forceps, and you just cannot find it. Has anybody had that? If you've ever dug for glass, you know how frustrating this can be. With an ultrasound, you can see the glass. You can see exactly where it is. And as we know, wood or uh, anything that is uh, some plastics, uh, organic matter doesn't show up on x-ray. So you can't even prove that the foreign body is there. Someone says, I feel like I have a splinter in my foot, but no one can say whether they do or you don't. Well, often we're like, I don't know. 
come back and if it's pussed out in two weeks then you had a splinter and we'll take it out which is you know reasonable but not fun or you can put an ultrasound on it and you can see that the splinter is there and help you remove it and because I am a bug geek you should know there's a lot of tropical infectious disease you can see on ultrasound too this is lymphatic filariasis you're looking here in the inguinal lymph, uh, lymph system you can see the worms you don't need the rest of the microscopic diagnostic lab and all the testing that's what this is you can diagnose this with an ultrasound looking in the groin how about schistosomiasis this is a pathognomonic finding for schisto it's called pipe stem fibrosis and um, you can see it here when you see that that's the only thing that looks like this that's schistosomiasis you can see ascaris uh, in there now this is just more just for fun I'd say the one place where it actually is clinically relevant is in wandering ascariasis where the worm will go up through the, the ampulla of vater up towards the gallbladder system and so you can find worms and flukes and things in the gallbladder system that's causing your gallbladder pathology and uh, this is a fluke that's what that is yeah. and then one that is pathognomonic like this is how you diagnose it is the kind of cocosis right so um, and so all of its staging and diagnosis is all done using ultrasound and so um, the last little piece I want you to talk about, talk to you about is thinking about systems not organs right we we've, we've kind of used it in saying this problem and that problem and this problem but what I think ultrasound is so cool about is that it can actually change how the system works depending upon what resources you have what do I mean by that a great example is something called FASH or focused abdomin abdominal sonography and HIV or assessment sonography and HIV and what this was essentially um, is uh, a friend of mine Tom Heller this is back in the day I think when did they publish this I don't know it's probably like, oh yeah 2010 so they're doing this research back in the early 2000s and the issue was that back then all TB meds were super highly regulated they only essentially came from the government and you could only give them if you were TB positive right because they're trying to fight resistance so you either had to have sputum positivity or you had to have a chest x-ray that was otherwise no TB meds. But what about all these people with HIV that you knew had extra pulmonary TB, but you couldn't prove it, right? Especially in KwaZulu-Natal or, you know, in resource limited areas, who's doing a lymph node biopsy? Who's going to prepare the slide? Who's going to read the slide? Like none of these things exist. So what they did is they used ultrasound to essentially show um, uh, five different or multiple different zones, essential point system where it's like, periodic lymph nodes, ascites, polar effusion, pericardial effusion. And if you have these things and if the score is high, it's just TB. And so they were able to jump tons of, of, uh, of logistical and structural uh, gaps in the system to treat these folks. They didn't need to do, uh, uh, to do a lymph node biopsy. They didn't need to pa prepare a, a, patholo a pathologic specimen. They didn't need a pathologist to read the specimen. They could just jump straight to the diagnosis. And thinking about using ultrasound in that way is just so cool. But the only reason that works is because it has to be in the right epidemiologic context, right? Like if I start doing that study in the U.S. or in a very low HIV and TB, a very low TB endemic area, then this isn't going to work. Which brings me to thinking about context. This is a, a case that I had at Mubimbili. A car accident, they come in, the, the resident does a FAST exam. The FAST is positive. They've already called surgery and by this time so that's finally when I'm getting involved. And you look at the patient and they really don't seem like they have a, a peritoneal abdomen and their trauma sounds pretty weak like the story is man i'm just surprised that that's what this is and so we had to have a discussion now i've got the internal medicine resident down there and the surgical resident down there and you know the surgeon's like i don't think this is a traumatic issue and the medicine resident's like no 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 they were in a car accident and they have a positive fast i cannot take them to the medical ward because they're going to die of trauma and i was like look guys there's one thing I am certain of, and that is that the patient is not staying down here. So what we're going to do is stick a needle in. If it comes out red, it goes to you. If it comes out yellow, it's going to you. Uh, everyone agree. And then, sure enough, we stick the needle in and a sight. So thinking about our tests, even the FAST exam or the FASH exam, is very much dependent upon your pretest probability of other pathologies, right? there's much more likely to find someone who is in their 30s or 40s and randomly has ascites here than you are at home, given elevated rates of tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, toxic herbs. There's just a lot more younger cirrhosis, especially because we have a lot of congenitally acquired hepatitis B. So we end up with younger patients in their 30s with very advanced liver pathology. Okay.
These are the views of the fash. And I ask you, all the smart people in the room who are working in these settings, to think about what the next fash exam is. I can't think of it. I'm not from here. But what problems are you seeing that ultrasound might help you jump structural gaps in the healthcare facility in which you work? And with that, I would normally take questions and be done, but we don't have time for questions. So I'll be done. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Dungo. Uh, so our next, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. John Botha. Dr. John Botha uh, completed his undergraduate and postgraduate from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He has a postgraduate in nephrology and clinical care fellowship uh, from University of British Columbus. He has interest in medical education, nephrology, clinical research, and global health. Uh, he has numerous publications. He's also in a um, in, in wide range of topics. This can be critical care nephrology, sedation practice, ventilation, and fertility of care. He's uh, an examiner for the College of uh, Intensive Care Medicine and delivered numerous basic and beyond basic mechanical ventilation courses. He serves as a board of, for most of Australia and New Zealand uh, intensive care society. Uh, today, um, I think his topic was supposed to be about fluids, but uh, uh, he's going to give a topic on ventilation because we had a very good, rather fluid uh, topic yesterday from another colleague. So we welcome him for that. So Mabula, thanks again for inviting me to Tanzania. It's my fourth trip here and I've always had great hospitality, so much appreciated. Apologies for changing my topic this morning, but I thought I'd talk about ventilation, particularly after hearing how critical care is changing in Tanzania and how emergency medicine is changing. So some of you will recall that ventilation was first administered years ago during the polio pandemic. And those patients were given ventilation through the iron lung. Patients were placed inside an iron box. Negative pressure was given and the chest expanded. I now show an architectural slide of a building in San Diego. And this is the Salk Institute, which was a building commissioned by Salk, who was the founder of the polio vaccine. And it's a stark reminder that despite us moving forward in health care, we remain standing on the shoulders of giants, the people who really changed the history of medicine and prevented many of the diseases that troubled people for so long. This is Bird, an aviator and physician who developed the Bird ventilator. And of course, some of you who've been practicing critical care and emergency medicine for some time will remember the Bird ventilator. As a young registrar, I had the simplistic view that a ventilator served a simple purpose. It got oxygen into the lung and carbon dioxide out the lung. But with time it became evident there was a lot more to ventilation. And what is the elephant in the room in a patient being ventilated? Well, the elephant in the room is ventilator-associated lung injury the ventilator is not necessarily a good thing. And we know now that there's an ongoing area of research in so-called ventilator-associated lung injury. And there are many aspects about mechanical ventilation which are bad for you. We know that oxygen is bad for you. Too much oxygen is bad. Large tidal volumes are bad. Volutoma is bad. 
high positive pressure inside the lung is bad. Opening and closing of the alveoli is bad because you have atelect trauma. And all this leads to biotrauma with the liberation of cytokines that fuel the inflammatory response. So I urge you when you use a ventilator to appreciate that it has consequences. And this next slide clearly shows what the lung looks like when you apply different positive pressures to that lung. These are old pathological specimens first described about 50 years ago, showing that if you give high levels of positive pressure ventilation to the lung, you damage the lung. And of course, here we have a normal alveolus on the left-hand side and an injured alveolus on the right-hand side where a patient is receiving positive pressure ventilation. And this, of course, leads to loss of epithelial and endothelial cell integrity, lung inflammation and edema, and ultimately ventilation perfusion is matching. So caution, please, when you apply positive pressure ventilation. When you do ventilate patient, if you look at this association between pressure and volume, you want to ventilate a patient in the safer zone. And if we look at this here, we see that if you overinflate the lung above the upper inflection point, you overdistend the lung. So you need to generate high changes in pressure for a small change in volume. And when you get to the low inflection point, you can in fact cause derecruitment of the lung. In the critically ill, one of the conditions which is always problematic to manage is the acute respiratory distress syndrome, a condition with bilateral alveolar infiltrates in the setting of normal cardiac function and an abnormal PF ratio. Now, importantly, in the supine patient with AODS, the process is not homogenous. You have an anterior zone, which is always inflated, a mid-zone, which collapses at end expiration, and finally, a posterior zone, which is always collapsed. So it's physiologically plausible to believe that these different parts of the lung will benefit from different ventilatory strategies. The anterior portion will benefit from small tidal volumes. The middle section may benefit from recruitment when you open up those alveoli. And finally, the lower section may benefit from positive pressure. And the next slide shows it all very clearly. Reduce tidal volumes in the part of the lung which is anterior and try and recruit and deliver PEEP to the posterior part of the lung in patients with ALDS. Now traditionally, patients who ventilated were given large tidal volumes, 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram. And this begs the question, why? Well, of course, historically intensive care was delivered by anaesthetists. So patients were given large tidal volumes in the operating theater, pushed across to the ICU, and we were told, the patient's in 12 or 15 mils a kilogram, away you go. But this publication, more than 20 years ago, has changed the way we ventilate patients. And I urge all of you to be familiar with this publication and the important message that came from the ArtsNet publication in 2000. Protective ventilation has significantly changed the way we mechanically ventilate patients and should mechanically ventilate patients. And what was this trial all about? Patients in intensive care with acute respiratory distress syndrome were ventilated on volume cycle assist control ventilation where they were given a certain volume in a controlled fashion and the attempt was made to keep the breath rate less than 35 and depending on the level of oxygenation the PEEP was incrementally increased. But there were two arms, a control arm and a treatment arm. And the important issue was that those patients in the control arm were given traditional large tidal volumes of 12 milliliters per kilogram. The treatment arm was given 6 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. And ideal body weight is determined by your height and your sex, not by what you think the patient should weigh from the foot of the bed. And an attempt was made to keep the plateau pressure less than 50 in the 12 milliliter group and if it went above 30 in the 6 milliliter group, the tidal volumes were progressively reduced. 
The trial was stopped after the enrolment of 860 patients because of the outcome. And what did it show? It showed that in those patients who were ventilated with smaller tidal volumes of 6 milliliters per kilogram, they had a far higher degree of survival, rate of survival, as opposed to those given larger tidal volumes. And if you look at the difference in mortality, 30% for those in 6 mils as opposed to 40% for those receiving 12 milliliters per kilogram. And there's subsequent data to show that even in patients coming out of theater, the tidal volume to deliver should be small, not large. So then if we assume that positive end expiratory pressure is beneficial and opens up alveoli, what is the data to show that more positive end expiratory pressure is going to improve outcomes. So the alveoli study done by the same researchers used exactly the same ventilatory strategy, six milliliters per kilogram, but patients were randomized to higher levels of PEEP, up to 13.2 to plus minus 3.5 centimeters of PEEP, as opposed to lower levels of PEEP, about eight with the hope that the higher levels of PEEP would improve outcome. Well, in fact, that was not the case. And if we look at the difference in death before discharge home, there was no difference, P value 0.48, and importantly, also no difference in terms of breathing without assistance. So this large trial did not show a benefit of giving higher levels of PEEP in patients who had delivered small tidal volumes. We know that PEEP improves oxygenation, but we can say it probably does not improve mortality. And two subsequent trials, both LOVE's trial and EXPRESS, had similar results. So what about recruitment? Opening up the lung with a period of very high positive pressure with the hope that this may improve oxygenation and improve outcomes. So we have here on the left-hand side a patient with lots of positive end expiratory pressure where the lung is expanded and the lung on the right hand side where you have a break in the positive pressure and the lung has collapsed. The rationale behind recruitment is to follow the so-called open lung strategy and this has three components. Open the lungs through recruitment, keep the lungs open through optimal PEEP and reduce lung injury by delivering small tidal volumes. A number of small studies have shown that when you give a recruitment maneuver to a patient, you will see an improvement in oxygenation, which is physiologically plausible. You've opened up those alveoli, you've improved ventilation perfusion matching, and with that an improvement in oxygenation. So the art investigators looked at this in a large randomized clinical trial that was published in JAMA about seven years ago. This was a multi-center study, nine countries, randomized, controlled trial. Patients who were receiving mechanical ventilation for less than 72 hours were evaluated. They were screened and there was a confirmatory phase. And patients were given a progressive increase in PEEP to recruit the lungs. All patients were in volume assist ventilation. The primary outcome was all-cause mortality until 28 days. And the recruitment maneuver was rather complex. You've got the airway pressure on the y-axis in time, on the x-axis, and in essence, patients were given a progressive incremental increase in PEEP until you recruited lung, PEEP was decreased and then again increased to maintain that level of recruitment with the hope that recruiting lung was going to improve outcome and improve mortality. Unfortunately, Conversely to what was expected, those patients who were assigned to, to the recruitment maneuver had a higher mortality. Recruitment increased death. So the art study probably laid to rest the view that recruitment should be applied to improve mortality in patients who are critically ill with AODS. I now want to talk about the important issue of driving pressure and why it is important. And driving pressure is that pressure required to open the lungs, the pressure between the PEEP and the so-called plateau pressure that I will explain later. 
Normally we assume that the lung is homogeneous and that the right and left lung have got a similar compliance. But in reality, we know that the process is often not homogeneous and one lung may be more compliant, more distensible than the other lung. And so the issue of driving pressure is an attempt to normalize the tidal volume depending on the physical characteristics of the lung. And the driving pressure is in fact the delta P, which is the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP. Let me explain that further. If we look at a pressure time curve in a patient's lung, we've got the peak inspiratory pressure, which is the highest pressure. And the peak inspiratory pressure consists of the flow through the airway, the resistance of the airway, the vo the plus the volume of gas you're trying to deliver over the compliance plus PEEP. But if you in fact arrest the flow of air and place an inspiratory pause in your patient, you are then getting the so-called plateau pressure. And the difference between the PEEP and the plateau pressure is in fact the driving pressure. Now what is the importance of trying to understand the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP? This was a study by Marcelo Amato's group, a Brazilian researcher, where he looked at over 3,500 patients with AODS enrolled in nine previously reported randomized controlled trials. And importantly, he calculated the driving pressure over the first 24 hours they were randomized in the trials, and they were divided into quintiles looking at the combination of PEEP, plateau pressure, and driving pressure. And the next slide is very important. I want you all to concentrate on the next slide. So we have here the top graphs look at different changes in driving pressure and PEEP. The lower graphs look at mortality of the patient. Now importantly, if you look at the first top slide on the left hand corner, you can see that there's a progressive increase in driving pressure, which is the gray bar, but the PEEP remains constant. And as the driving pressure increases, the difference between the PEEP and the plateau pressure, you have a consistent increase in patient mortality. If the driving pressure remains constant, the mortality remains the same. And if the driving pressure falls, there, you see a decrease in mortality. So it is the driving pressure which seems to determine <coughs> the mortality of patients with stiff lungs and AODS. So the take home message here is give small tidal volumes in patients who have bilateral alveolar infiltrates and monitor the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP, the driving pressure, because it impacts on mortality. So now you ventilate a patient using small tidal volumes and you find the patient still deteriorate. Well, prone ventilation was first used in surgical patients and it was used to treat hypoxic failure in the 70s. And why is that so? Well, quite simply, if you are in a supine position, you have mediastinal weight pressing down on the posterior axis aspects of the lung and alternating ventilation perfusion matching. If you prone the patient, these forces are removed. And if you review the CT scan on your right hand side, you can see the difference in the CT scan between a patient in a supine position as opposed to a patient in the prone position. So there's a physiological plausibility to this. There was a small study published by the Italian researcher Gattinoni almost 20 years ago in a small number of th patients, 304, which showed that oxygenation did improve when you proned a patient, but there was no difference in survival. But this landmark study, the Perceiver study, published 10 years ago, showed a marked difference in mortality when patients were proned. In this multi-center trial, patients with AODS in the treatment arm 
underwent prone positioning for at least 16 hours. The primary outcome was a proportion of patients who died from any cause within 28 days after inclusion. And this was a very, very positive study. Proning early for prolonged periods lowered mortality with a far greater cumulative probability of survival. So we know that prone ventilation improves oxygenation and mortality in conjunction with lung protective ventilation. Prone ventilation should be considered in patients and finally when being considered it should be applied early. So what about oscillation? For those of you who've worked in pediatric intensive care units, you may have applied oscillatory ventilation, which in essence is delivering high frequency ventilation at very small tidal volumes. So here we have the classic assist control or CLV ventilation with large tidal volumes at a slow rate and below that the smaller tidal volumes at a far greater frequency in patients with oscillation. Well, there were two large studies published in the last decade. The Canadians and the Nile Ferguson published the Oscillate study 10 years ago. This was a multi-center trial. Patients were randomized in a block center, block-like fashion stratified by center. 38 centers in five countries, mainly North America, but also Chile, Saudi Arabia, and India. And this was a population of intubated patients with bad lungs who were hypoxic, requiring a lot of oxygen. The patients in high frequency ventilation were delivered high frequency ventilation using that ventilator, and the control group used conventional ventilation. This showed that if you were given oscillation, you had a lower likelihood of survival. It was bad for you. So the oscillate trial was one of the first large multi-center trials to show that oscillation was probably not in the patient's best interest. The British under Duncan Young did the OSCAR trial, which didn't show quite the same difference in mortality, but there was a difference in the way these two trials were set up and a subtle difference in study design. If patients are positive in fluid balance for a prolonged period of time in intensive care, it's physiologically plausible that you have a greater risk of pulmonary edema. And of course, this was something considered in the FACT trial, where it was thought that a restrictive fluid strategy is more likely to improve outcomes and less likely to worsen gas exchange. So this was a study with conservative fluid versus liberal fluid. A randomized study comparing conservative and liberal strategies, the primary endpoint, death at 60 days. This study had no difference at all in the primary endpoint of death at 60 days, but there was a greater incidence of ventilator-free days in those patients on a restrictive fluid strategy. So what about novel therapies? Because I noted there were a few slides reviewing ECMO initially in, this, in, the, in the meeting. Well, we know that in America there has been a rapid uptake of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation over the last 20 years. And if you look at the number of ECMO cases on the left-hand side, we can see that it's gone up from 3,000 and 2,000 right up to almost 9,000 patients a year by 2019. And the number of ECMO centers has also risen exponentially. So more and more centers are using extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with ECMO, what is it? Well, in fact, there are two types of ECMO, venovenous ECMO and veno-arterial ECMO. And in essence, venovenous ECMO, as the name implies, means that you remove blood from a vein through a pump through an oxygenator, and oxygenated blood is returned to the patient's vein. Whereas vena arterius ECMO, you remove blood from a vein and return it to an artery. And what is the difference between these two? Well, in fact, this simple scheme shows that vena venous ECMO is primarily used in patients who have a problem with oxygenation and are hypoxic. 
that's your far left hand s slide there, that's vena venous. Once the patient becomes shocked or has significant right ventricular failure, you would then rather deploy vena arterial ECMO. A newer strategy which has become widely used in the last decade is so-called extracorporeal CO2 removal or ECOR and this is the group of patients where the primary problem is getting rid of carbon dioxide and oxygenation is not a problem so that the extracorporeal device just removes carbon dioxide. And the advantage of the ECOR device as opposed to the traditional VA or VV ECMO device is that the blood flow rate is a lot slower. If we look at this A lung, the blood flow rate here of 440 milliliters per minute is really not significantly different from the blood flow rate used in patients in hemodialysis. So in our unit, one of my colleagues, Professor Dhruva Pati, is doing more and more work seeing the role of ECO, particularly in asthmatic patients, in patients with end-stage obstructive airways disease, and those with very, very high physiological dead space. And now Baxter has developed the Prisma lung, which in fact looks like an artificial kidney called the Prisma lung, which can remove CO2. So in summary, for those of you who start to embark on the journey of ventilation, use protective ventilation with small tidal volumes. I can't stress the importance of that. If you cannot oxygenate your patient using conventional methods, don't just dial up the O2 because O2 is harmful to the lung. Don't just dial up the pressures because positive pressure ventilation is bad for the lung. Consider proning, get the patient on their tummy, and work towards having a protocol in your unit so that your staff is comfortable with proning a patient. And if you're going to prone, do it early for at least 16 hours a day. There's no evidence for recruitment in terms of mortality. You may get a temporary improvement in oxygenation, but there's no data to show that it alters survival. There's also no evidence in the adult population from oscillation. And you'll hear later on about conservative oxygen therapy. And for those of you who have the ability to deliver extracorporeal circulation, be that ECMO or ECO, it may be something which becomes more widely used in the future, particularly in units who have the expertise and the funding to deliver that therapy. So thank you very much for your hospitality, Peter, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. John. Um, you all want to stand up and stretch a bit? Great. Feels like everybody needed that stretch. Yep. Okay. Um, we can get seated if you've got your stretching. Um, so our next presenter, uh, our next presenter is Dr. Ali Akrabi. Dr. Ali Akrabi is a senior emergency physician at Bugando Medical Center in Mwanza. He is obviously the member of Emergency Medicine Association of Tanzania and the Essential Emergency and Critical Care, that is the EECC. He serves as an honorary faculty for Mwimbili University of Health and Allied Science, coordinating elective students that uh, visit Bugando from Mwimbili University. His interests are sepsis, cardiac emergency, leadership, and teaching. Good afternoon. 
afternoon, everybody. My name is Ali Akrabi, has been introduced, and I welcome, I welcome you to this uh, presentation. The early sepsis detection and management, what, what does it mean for resource-limited settings? I bet every one of you in your shift, you may have seen or you may encounter one or more patients with sepsis. I have no financial non-financial disclosures to report. By definition, uh, sepsis is defined as a life-threatening syndrome or a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. When any microorganism gets into the blood, they spread into the body and the toxin they provide uh, stimulates the host immune response and that's what uh, brings about the sepsis and that's if not treated early, it may cause organ dysfunctions. And septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which the underlying circulatory and, se uh, and cellular or metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase the mortality. It's a subset of sepsis whereby you may have a cardiovascular dysfunction and uh, uh, a severe metabolic or uh, biochemical dysfunction that may warrant uh, or may increase the probability of death. More than 40% in even high income countries live about the low and middle income countries. So you may see from the definition that uh, the definition of severe sepsis is not applied anymore because uh, from the, uh, the quality improvement program shows that the, the patients with sepsis will not be diagnosed early, will not be aggressively treated unless it comes with organ dysfunction, that's when the, 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 the aggressive treatment uh, comes. And that may delay the treatment in sepsis. And once defined as sepsis as life-threatening, there is no need of saying severe sepsis. Once you have a sepsis, you have diagnosed the patient with sepsis, that's already as a medical emergency. So the burden of sepsis in low middle income countries, I'll uh, give the, the, the data from Tanzania. The, uh, the data from Bugando showed the incidence of sepsis of 38.9% in neonates in 2010 and the mortality contributed by 19% uh, out of those admission. And the study done in uh, Muhimbili by then 2020 by Tumaini Mhada showed the neonatal uh, sepsis incidence of 24% and uh, a quarter of those admitted died. 31.4% uh, uh, of the units uh, on the data taken at Mwanyamala and Temeke uh, showed the incidence of sepsis. And in children, the, the recent study in uh, 2017, in children from 28 days up to 14 years, showed uh, a 19.4 incidence of sepsis with a mortality of 14.2%. Sepsis is among the leading causes of maternal, uh, sepsis, uh, maternal death, contributing about 17% in sub Saharan Africa. In general, the WHO and the uh, root uh, Ki uh, et al. Uh, reported an estimated of 48.9 million sepsis cases in 2017 globally and about 11 million deaths. That's contribute about 20% out of uh, these, uh, the sepsis cases. And low middle income countries accounted for over 75% of sepsis related deaths. So you can see the burden of the uh, sepsis uh, in low middle income countries, but also it affects high income countries, but because of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the intervention that uh, uh, are already set, they may have a few uh, deaths out of the sepsis. Now, looking at the screening and prognostication uh, tool or criteria for sepsis, there are numerous uh, which have been studied and we have the SAS criteria, you have the quick uh, SOFA, you have the SOFA, you have the national early warning score, you have the modified early warning score, 
and the others, the MEDS, Apache, and the Simplified Acute Physiological Scope. But the, the most validated in, uh, out of the ICU is the uh, SARS criteria and the QSOFA and the NEWS as compared to the others, the, the SOFA, the Apache, and the SAPS too, which are more relevant in the patients inside the ICU, and those determine the mortality, but also the ICU stay, the length of ICU stay uh, of the septic patients. So most of the times we, we use the SAS criteria and the QSOFA as the easiest uh, uh, screening tool and the prognostication tool for the patients with uh, sepsis. So why did I talk about the early detection and management of sepsis? The, the study shows by uh, Damiani et al. that from the studies of uh, 50 observational studies, the pool data showed the uh, early detection and management of uh, sepsis reduced the mortality by about 34%. That's the odds ratio of uh, 0 0.66 uh, from a systematic review and meta-analysis. And in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, there are, there are limited uh, study, but one observational uh, study by Shevin Jacobs in, in Uganda showed the uh, the mortality of 33% in those patients that followed the sepsis bundle of 6 hours and 24 hours as compared to those that were ob on observation that were given the, uh, the normal treatment. So the sepsis bundle of 6 hours that include the early uh, uh, administration of wide spectrum antibiotics fluid, uh, um, judicious uh, fluid administration, but also mo mo monitoring of patients. But 24 hours included also the second dose of the, anti uh, the antimicrobials, which on studies show that the second dose of antimicrobials is equally important as the first dose antimicrobial that the patient may be given, and that also determine the, the, the mortality. The complications of sepsis, uh, that, that we know that you may have a septic shock, acute kidney injury as a single organ injury, or you may have a DIC, acidosis, glucose derangement, you may have hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, anemia, electrolyte imbalance that may come from acidosis or renal failure, or if the patient uh, had been having a uh, fluid loss from vomiting and diarrhea, but also can lead to multi-organ failures, and that these are all contributory to death in patients with sepsis. And there are more that uh, uh, are not known in sepsis that can contribute to, to death. The challenges in early detection and management of sepsis uh, in our settings is a delayed presentation. Delayed presentation in a patient that uh, has uh, the symptoms of sepsis or an infection, then until the patient uh, becomes um, uh, prostrated uh, or very ill, that's when they present to the hospital. Um, most of the time they can start with the over-the-counter over the medication and uh, then later when it fails, then they present to the hospital um, at late stages. So even the um, the, there was a study that was done in children at uh, Muimbili that showed the delayed presentation of children with fever and sepsis uh, contributed to the uh, mortality, more mortality compared to those who were uh, 
early presented to the hospital uh, below 48 hours. But also the low socioeconomic status uh, the, uh, of our population and the high cost of care. The, the government is trying to subsidize the, the care, but still in rural areas or remote areas that the, uh, the patients may present late due to low socioeconomic status. Limited provider and hospital capacity. You have the antimicrobial resistance, immunocompromised patients like HIV, diabetes, mellitus, cancer, and renal failure. I may discuss this uh, in the next slides. Tuberculosis, malaria, viral infection, and deep fungal infection uh, may also be uh, concurrent with sepsis, or they can be the, the, the cause of the, the sepsis. But also the, the variability in sensitivity and specificity of each uh, screening tool or the diagnostic criteria can contribute to the challenge in healthcare associated infection. When we come to the delayed presentation and low socioeconomic environment, as I discussed that there is a delayed presentation to hospital, but also there can be um, delayed decision and uh, referral to uh, um, higher or tertiary centers for definitive care, maybe because of the uh, logistical um, issues, uh, but that can, um, uh, that can contribute to the deterioration or the death of the patient. But also poor health-seeking behavior of our patients, uh, traveling at long distances when you're in a remote area, there's past uh, settlements and uh, also the, uh, the health uh, setting may, may be far from the population. But poor sanitation and hygiene, high cost of care, and non-essential uh, antimicrobial, which can be very expensive and are not subsidized. But the limited skills on provider and hospital capacity, we may have a limited clinician's exposure for training protocols, screening capability, and quality improvement programs that may pertain to sepsis care, management, and detection. We may have a, a, a limited diagnostic capabilities availability of effective medicines or antimicrobials, and monitoring capabilities uh, of the sepsis patient that may be seen in under-resourced setting. And failure of implementing antimicrobial stewardship. There is no control or the reasons, uh, the supervision on the, uh, the antimicrobial management, but also if you give the antimicrobial, there should be the reasons for you giving it and escalating the antimicrobial from one stage or from one uh, group of antibiotics to another, they should be the reasons for, for, for you to do that. But uh, there may be irrational use of the antimicrobial that may lead to resistance. But there may be a limited emergency and ICU capacity as the sepsis need to, to have a close monitoring and aggressive treatment, uh, the emergency and ICU could be this, uh, the, the sections of the hospital that may cater uh, the needs for sepsis patients. The widespread antimicrobial resistance, there are limited reports on regularly updated antimicrobial surveillance, and the government now is working on the antimicrobial surveillance. The, the, the task force has been uh, uh, created in the country that uh, uh, could be um, uh, uh, monitoring on the anti antimicrobial surveillance and reporting to the to the Ministry of Health for dissemination. And uh, at Bugando, we had a report that uh, even using the ampicillin for the uh, E. coli has a 90% resistance. Uh, in management of the patient with sepsis or urosepsis and uh, still is, be, is still being used. Sefriaxone has showed about 57% uh, percent resistance. And um, the cotrimoxazole shows the about 80% percent uh, resistance in E. coli um, management. But now what can you do? Now the new antimicrobials that come in that may be effective for sepsis are very expensive. 
the government may not subsidize that and that becomes a high cost for the patients and but even in the hospital especially those who are admitted in the hospitals but the comorbidities existence of multiple comorbidities which may inc uh, which are immunocompromised like hiv aids diabetes mellitus advanced cancer malnutrition renal failure sickle cell disease liver disease and heart failure may worsen the sepsis condition and the management. They can uh, often warrant multiple antimicrobials uh, for wider coverage and treatment of many other complications that set in due to their pre-existing condition. <clears throat> but sepsis can occur due to other infections that may not be bacterial sepsis. It can be due to TB, the, we are endemic for, uh, for, the, uh, we are endemic for, for, the, for TB, malaria. Studies in children, even uh, in Tanzania, showed 7% of septic children were due to malaria. Tuberculosis is prevalent, in, in, in immunocompromised, especially HIV, but also non uh, uh, immunocompromised patients. COVID-19 as a viral inf infection uh, is a, an epidemic but uh, used to be a, a, a pandemic but now uh, there are uh, still some cases, sporadic cases that happen and it should be a suspicion in any patients who comes with pneumonia like uh, presenting uh, symptoms. Invasive fungal infections in critical patients and immunocompromised patients should always be suspected in a septic patient and especially uh, patients who are in ICU or need to panic patients. Uh, organ transplant, but we are few in organ transplant. We are very uh, few in doing that, uh, but also uh, the patients with uh, HIV. So we always have to think that uh, if the bacteria, uh, the anti, uh, antibacterial fails to treat the patient within five to seven days, the protocol suggests using the antifungal uh, systemic uh, an, uh, antifungal medication. The variation in sensitivity and specificity of screening tools also pose the challenge in screening the septic patient. If you use one tool, it may not be enough like the SARS may have a sensitivity of 71%. It may be better, but uh, um, the specificity is very low. It's between 40 and 50%. QSOFA also has a low sensitivity of 64%, but a high specificity. So in other studies also, you can see the variation of the sensitivity and specificity of these uh, screening tools. The healthcare associated infection, the, that's the hospital acquired infections, also pose the risk for sepsis management. And uh, if you see at uh, this plot, on my right hand side, you could see that the low middle income countries had uh, higher incidences of hospital acquired or hosp healthcare associated in infection with an average of uh, 12 uh, patients over 100 uh, patients who are admitted they can be infected with uh, hospital acquired infection as compared to uh, high income countries which ha has an average of about 6 to 7 uh, patients over 100 patients so the our surroundings our in the hospital uh, if not contained and not treated then they can pose the risk of uh, contracting the hospital acquired infection which are notorious uh, uh, on the management of sepsis and may contribute to to death Now, how to mitigate the challenges in early sepsis detection and management? 
training and urging, uh, and urging on consultation by primary health care clinicians on understanding seps sepsis and timely management. Always there should be a regular consultation and um, uh, training and uh, the education on awareness of sepsis even in the low level settings so that they can initiate the treatment before the patient is referred to a tertiary hospital so that the time can be uh, saved. But treat uh, sepsis aggressively in the first contact with the protocol that uh, uh, you may be given by the Ministry of Health or the local uh, protocol or the international uh, guidelines that is providing. Use the screening tools interchangeably. You cannot rely on one screening tool. Uh, you can use interchangeably that will help you to screen the patient with uh, sepsis. You can use the SOFA and at times you can use the SAS. And especially children that uh, the Q SOFA may not be uh, has not been uh, validated. So you can use the SAS uh, very easily and apply it to children. But the use of electronic uh, medical records now, we have, advan uh, we have uh, uh, developed uh, in our settings to use the, the EMR, the electronic medical records, which can be automated that it can give you the screening of a patient even with the vital signs. The nurse can be able to diagnose. It can be automated that you can, uh, the, the, the computer may able to, once you uh, you plug in your vital signs that the computer is or the electronic medical records is able to alert you that do you think this patient may be uh, may have sepsis so that you can uh, be reminded all the time to diagnose on sepsis but always the septic patients that you have initi initiated the treatment always need to be monitored and the, the first 24 hours are very important in monitoring of septic patient for decision making uh, clinically, but also using the vital signs and laboratory wise. The first 24 hours is very important when you first, the first bundle, and then you, you, you reassess the patient once you have started your, your treatment. Antimicrobial uh, stewardship, as I talked about, is uh, very important that uh, if you find the, the antibiotics or antimicrobial uh, is not working for the 48 to 72 hours, always have a, a, a background or the decision to escalate the care uh, to another group of the uh, second line antibiotics or uh, you do the more investigations to know if there could be other concurrent infections. But also the early decision for, for referral. Regularly up updating and distributed, uh, distributing the antimicrobial sensitivity pattern will help the healthcare setting for the decision in every uh, uh, infection that may come in or may be admitted in the, in the hospital. To standardize the care with regularly updated national treatment guidelines, essential medicines list, and individual hospital protocols for sepsis care. But also to join the global uh, campaign and the commemoration of World, World Sepsis Day on sepsis prevention. We think that uh, when we campaign on this in our community on uh, personal hygiene but also good sanitation, and going from the tertiary hospitals to lower level hospitals to educate on sepsis will help much in uh, mitigating the sepsis risk for, for mortality. Strict implementation of IPC guidelines and protocols in the hospitals and also to design a quality improvement progr uh, programs to support and supervise the, the prevention of sepsis in our health, health, health settings. Regular check-up uh, check of pregnant mothers 
and patients with comorbidities is very important uh, that um, may prevent uh, them to get a severe form of sepsis. Multi-speciality approach, multi-speciality consultation always is one uh, is encouraged that uh, we may help the patient with uh, uh, sepsis or septic shock and looking for any cause or the to control the source of the infection like if the patient has an abscess whenever you treat the sepsis look for the source and if the patient has a surgical uh, source then you have to involve the other speciality for the care <clears throat> but high clinical uh, suspicion and screening for malaria tuberculosis in endemic areas and in endemic area that we always have to screen for malaria for every children but even adults who present with sepsis nationwide uh, vaccination and chemoprophylaxis to vulnerable groups uh, like the COVID-19 uh, vaccine may help to get the severe form of the COVID-19 or COVID sepsis uh, TB uh, uh, vaccination and all other uh, vaccination uh, influenza uh, vaccination may help to uh, prevent severe form of these illnesses so to conclude sepsis even in the early stages sh should be treated as a medical emergency and mitigating or, uh, uh, mi mi mitigating the challenges will help to treat these uh, septic patients follow the surviving sepsis uh, campaign international sepsis and septic shock recommendations is updated every uh, four or five years that uh, we can uh, take these and uh, mo modify in our settings that we can implement so that we can improve our sepsis care but also to adopt the Ministry of Health and the WHO IPC guidelines for the prevention of healthcare associated infections and sepsis. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions or comments. Thank you. So thank you to all the six morning presenters. Uh, and uh, before we go to lunch, I had promised that we'll take in questions since the morning. If you had them written down, any comments, um, just raise your hands and Alvin and the team will work with me to get the mic towards you. So um, if you had any questions written, any comments, we'll take about three to four and then we'll head up for lunch. They're just finishing up their lunch setup. So that gives us a little bit of time. First, I just want to compliment the speakers on some really interesting and well-prepared um, talks. I have a question for Dr. Botha on uh, conservative oxygen therapy, because when I practiced, started practicing, it was like, give oxygen, give oxygen, whatever you do, give oxygen. And then we were told oxygen was toxic. So now what are we supposed to do with the information that the conservative oxygen doesn't make any difference. I mean, are we, do we still want to preserve oxygen because um, we're trying to avoid toxicity, or does that not matter anymore? And then I have a question for our neurosurgeon. Is she still here in the room? Okay. Oh, yeah? No. Well, then I won't ask that question. <laughs> okay.
So, the one who presented on traumatic brain injury, Shiro. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to uh, make one comment um, personally, and I don't know. Um, I think most of us are really um, excited and uh, humbled that uh, we are at this conference. Big stuff are happening, lots of knowledge and eye-opening um, things. I have two questions. Uh, one I want to ask... Um, Dr. Kuzema, um, so um, it's really uh, interesting to see what uh, you do uh, interventions on acute coronary syndrome. I was sitting here and wondering like, what is your major um, challenge? What do you think that the EM system as could do better to make your job more easier when it comes to acute coronary syndromes? like? by experience, like what are we doing that we can improve to make it uh, better on your side. Um, and another one goes to um, Steve. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for the ultrasound. I know everyone, me in the, actually every day, amazed of how ultrasound changes the cause of illness of uh, patients that we see at the emergency. But there is a problem that I, I faced personally, but I think my colleagues will agree. When the radiology colleagues thinks we are stealing and we are trying to do their job, which makes life very difficult, like even the administrators would make it hard for maintaining our point of care ultrasounds or buying new ones for some places that don't have, because they're like, why do you want that? We have radiology across the, uh, the room. How do you navigate that, the, uh, uh, the fight of um, you are not a certified ultrasonographer? Why do you want ultrasound? And um, to make everybody here like have that portable magic working equipment at the emergency department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to pose a question to Dr. Alphonse on acetaminophen toxicity because uh, I was wondering why the combination of both drugs was made to be used, if, uh, used on a massive uh, toxicity. Rather, I was thinking on the normal circumstance whereby you find a, uh, a patient who otherwise you don't even, you're uncertain on the time with which he ingested the drugs, or maybe you're having a serum concentration around which is equivocal around 420. So eventually on that position you say do or die. So is it because more of what are we worried about to start the combination of both drugs as early as possible? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a question on nootropics. Yeah. So among the among the characteristics and some components in the displayed examples were that it gives uh, the it has the component of antioxidants, but also improves memories and sometimes gives you concentration. So I just like to ask if also we can have the components from cigarettes and uh, marijuana, some energy drinks, if they can also act the same like uh, how the topic was going on. Even sometimes people do say even bangi can also do the same, giving us smartness if we take it uh, just in low doses, not that much. So the presenter may respond to me. Okay, um, I think we can start with these rounds of questions, um, and uh, I'll answer that, and then I'll pose mine to also Dr. Kuzema. So I'll answer that. Um, 
good luck that when I was doing a literature review, there is nicotine is one of the neotropes. It's just that you can't chew it, you can't smoke it, but in small doses, there's a study that says taking nicotine in small doses has a uh, neotropic effect. So thank God I read the paper that gets me to answer this. But they didn't say anything about marijuana. I'll not talk on literature that I don't know about. Uh, I definitely did get a literature on, on nicotine, and yes, it is a neotropic, what, eaten in small doses, not smoked, not chewed. Um, I hope that answers it. I'll, I'll, I'll do better with the marijuana, maybe I'll need. If you have data, that's also good. And uh, before I read the rest answer, I have a question for Dr. Kuzema. Um, so uh, thank you, what you presented is the standard and I know we are trying to move towards the standard. But I'm trying to think in context of what Dr. Uh, Erasto said yesterday. In Tanzania right now, every region has an, an emergency department and there are uh, 87 new districts that are having emergency department in Tanzania. The only public hospital that can conv that can can do an a PCI is JKCI. So we are having 87, uh, 100 or whatever, 107 or 109. I, one of the numbers there, new emergency department. You work at the only place that can do uh, uh, PCI, and uh, not only that, there are places that. Do not have, we, are, we are a place that does not even have an EMS again. So these people will move from Mwanza to Dar es Salaam. That's a bus for, I think, 12 plus hours to come to you. So in context of our setting, in context of this new 100 plus emergency department, how do we manage AC, ACS? And I know when I, when I used to do mentorship in this area, I go like, go for your paracetamol, crop it grow right now. And I think you just gave up a preamble that these drugs are not good when it comes to you guys as interventionists. So how do you take this? Like, in context to our settings where your, your institute, which is 12 hours, 14 hours away from most of the common Tanzanians who possibly are not in this room, how do they manage it? Do you want us, when we are doing mentorship in these areas, to go and go like, hey guys, so don't give this medication, just rush them in JKCI because you could put them in danger. Like, how do we take this in our context? So I'm sorry for pinning this, and you can answer last. We can start with the first person who was asked, and yeah, I think this is. Hi, so the question really was about how much oxygen to deliver to a patient. And I guess the largest trial, uh, which was well designed, was Paul Young's trial from New Zealand, which is a ROCKS trial, in which patients in intensive care were randomized to conventional oxygen therapy and conservative oxygen therapy, where the FiO2 was decreased to keep the saturation less than 97% in the treatment arm. The conventional arm was allowed to have any saturation over 90. The primary outcome was ventilator three days, and there was no difference in outcomes between those patients who were allowed to have high oxygen levels and those patients where the oxygen levels were maintained below 97%. Now, I do know that my colleague, where is Dr. Sanger? He is giving a whole session this afternoon on liberal versus conservative oxygen therapy. So I think there's going to be a lot more on that in the session this afternoon. But that is the, the summary of the ROCKS trial. I, I hope that answered your question. Regarding doses of uh Pomepizol and NAC together. So the answer to that is NAC is the only uh, approved antidote for paracetamol toxicity. But studies and reports showed that Pomepizol can be used as an adjunct. Okay, so it's, you know, for a drug to be approved, it goes through a series of phases of approval and tests. There are good results in animal models, but just case reports and anecdotal reports on human consumption. So that will be the answer to that. It's still not approved. So um, thank you very much. For, I think I'll combine both the answers together because it makes uh, 
sense to combine both the answers. Um, so basically, like I said, the first thing is that it starts with you guys at an EMD to recognize the pattern of ECG to say that this is acute coronary syndrome, yes or no. The second thing is that I'll, I'll, I think I might preempt the question you asked to the sonographer as well because if you can do a fast ultrasound to see how the LV function of this patient is, is there any mechanical complication to this myocardial infarction? You see, what happens is that you always start looking for a cardiologist or you start looking for a physician. I think you, you guys are also physicians by itself and you guys do a lot in terms of acute settings and it's all about teamwork. I sometimes get calls at midnight that your cardiologist refuse or your fellow refused to come to EMD and then I help them out in terms of that. See, everyone doesn't think on the same line. So if you guys can pick up the diagnosis, if you guys can read the ECG and say, no, this is acute coronary syndrome, I've done a fast ultrasound, LV function is preserved, there's no mechanical complication to this, please get these patients on board. Now, if you come to in terms of what are we doing with the patients who are outside the Dandara slum area, the first thing is to get cat labs. But if you get a cat labs, you need an interventional cardiologist. How many interventional cardiologists do we have in Tanzania? Maximum is 15. So how do you distribute these 15 of them? And out of those 15, um, three are they, they are there in training at the moment with us. And the rest of the 12, um, two are in private hospital, one is in Dodoma and the rest are GKCI. So how do you get cat labs when you don't have interventional cardiologists? So what we're doing at JKCI is hopefully next year we are introducing an interventional cardiology curriculum from JKCI, which will be a follow-up with an MSc cardiology for next two years, so that we reproduce more interventional cardiology so that we can get more cat labs in the country. So if you have a cat lab in Arusha and if you don't have an interventional cardiology, it's, it's not worth to put that cat lab in. So first thing is to get thrombolysis in every place, every corner of the country. How to administer thrombolysis in an acute care? That should be the first goal of us to save these patients. Once you get the thrombolysis, you still have a time frame to refer this patient. The next thing comes is a loading dose. When you are in Dar es Salaam, the question comes in that when you give a loading dose and if you get a patient with triple vessel disease, our surgeon don't touch them. They said, look. I can't do an emergency bypass because we are not equipped to do an emergency bypass in these patients. So what we do is we just do a balloon angioplasty to this patient. So if in a remote area, yes, you should give the loading dose, which is aspirin 300, clopidogrel 600. The essence of loading dose is that if the patient comes after 24 hours, to us, we load them again. And the reason of loading dose is that when we place a stent in a coronary artery, we give them a loading dose of heparin. The heparin allows the stent to set in, and the antiplatelet which you have given as a loading dose helps to prevent stent thrombosis. Now, if you use clopidogrel and as aspirin as a loading dose, it increases the platelet, um, it reduces the platelet aggregation, and it gives you time of around two to three hours before it starts working. If you use ticagrelor in this patient, ticagrelor has a half-life very early, so ticagrelor works in half an hour's time. So why do we tell you to give loading dose is for us when we do a PCI, we don't want that acute stent thrombosis. That's the only essence of giving a loading dose. Loading dose won't improve the function, uh, not improve the STEMI or an acute coronary syndrome. The essence of loading dose is that when we put a stent in, the stent shouldn't get a stent thrombosis and that's why we give loading dose. So, so the reason I'm saying that first thing is get these things. Aspirin, clopidogrel are available everywhere in Tanzania. Statins, etoastatins are available. The only thing which is missing in the puzzle is thrombofibrinolytics at the moment. And that's what we are fighting for to get, even if you can get streptokinase. Streptokinase works very well. The only issue with streptokinase is you can't do a repeated dose. When you get a failure of fibrinolytics, that's now when emergency comes and you need to transfer this patient to a PCI center where now emergency PCI can be done. Right? But in my practice for over five years, I've seen only three cases of failure of fibrinolytics. So you can see the failure rate is low. So the aim for now for us and the STEMI um, group is to get thrombolysis on board to every emergency center. And you emergency guys, give the thrombolysis first, stabilize your patient, transfer the patient. The transfer question comes in, that are our ambulance equipped to transfer this patient? Now this is another step where I think you guys can do a, a research or if you can get on board people who can now go and see or do a study on how our ambulances are. 
Are they well equipped to transfer these patients from one center to another center? Are they equipped to get a CPR done inside that? Are they equipped to have a um, defibrillator inside that? Because when there is an ongoing ischemia, there are high chances of arrhythmias. And you might need to shock this patient as well. So all these things are still early in our country, but I think one day we'll get there, and this is what we're advocating. And you guys are the first line for us. So it starts from you, but don't be despair if a cardiologist say, oh, there is nothing, don't worry about it. Look for other sources. We are all there, and that's why the essence of the STEMI group, which we opened up on WhatsApp, we respond any time of the day. And I think there are doctors here who have been getting response from us now and then. So don't despair. Ask, keep on asking in the group. Keep on bringing up your questions, and let's save this muscle. And this is what my target is, that in down the line in the next five years, hopefully we can get somewhere around STEMI and save these muscles. Thank you. Okay, is this on? Can you guys hear me in this thing? I can't hardly hear myself. Um, okay, so I think if I understood the question, it was kind of a multi-part question regarding ultrasound. The first of which is, you know, we have radiologists who might say, you're stealing our money, is what it distills like. You're doing my job, you're doing my studies. And I feel like this breaks into sort of two buckets. The first bucket is, is uh, more about um, their professional ego. They're worried that you're doing their job. Now with, and, and then the other bucket is the money bucket, so I'll kind of address them separately. The first piece is I would sit down with my radiology colleagues along with your, whoever your hospital administrators are and help them understand we are not doing radiologic studies. None of my, I mean in the sense of they do a formal scan in a very specific way that they're taught to from their uh, radiologic training, which is very different than often what we are doing. What we are doing, and I would say the analogy is a stethoscope. You don't tell me I can't use a stethoscope. This is exactly the same thing, it's just visual. All it is is sound vibrations, and instead of listening to them, I'm looking at them, right? And I'm using this to make clinical diagnoses. And the second piece is, I, I always assure, and when I start point of care ultrasound, I've kind of done this at a bunch of big institutions, and the first thing I do before I start is I sit down with radiology, and I assure them that we will order whatever formal study we would have ordered, we will continue to order. Their concerns are twofold. One, that they're losing their job, and two, they're losing revenue. That's always a piece of this. Now, as you get further into your career and as things develop, we can start to talk about whether there is a role for you billing for your studies. Like at our shop, we do bill for our studies, but it's billed very differently than a formal radiologic study. The billing is different, the amount of compensation is different, but nonetheless, you can recover those costs. The reason that that's important is because then when you're talking to your administrator about why should I buy you an ultrasound you know we, we already have an ultrasound it's in radiology um, you know you can if you can recover some of that compensation that can help to offset those costs but the argument you need to make to them is everybody knows the radiology ultrasound is often some beast of a machine that you're trying to wheel around it's locked behind three doors and the person with the key is never there when you actually need to do the scan um, I will also say that there are many new types of ultrasounds on the market that are much cheaper and much more portable um, and function for our purposes in the emergency department. So I hope I've answered your question to a certain extent. It's a very common, common complaint. But as far as why we're doing point of care, first you say, we're not doing the same thing. I'm not trying to take your job. I will never be doing formal you know, liver scans or what are, pancreas scans. or I'm not doing any of that. And two, if they're wondering why is this under your purview, you say 100% yes. This is, if you look at every developed emergency medicine system, point of care ultrasound is a core mandatory requirement of our skill set. It would be like someone saying that you, know, you can't, I don't know, intubate or you can't put a splint on or you can't suture or anything else. It is a basic fundamental requirement of emergency medicine training. So um, that shouldn't be any doubt. I hope that answers it. Um, I th think lunch should be ready. They, were, they told us it would be 10 minutes late and we're, we're past that. Um, if we have any questions, we are, we're probably seeing 
these guys during lunch? Can we like tap them on the shoulder and have a conversation? Otherwise, I think it's the right time to head out for lunch. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, thank you.